Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Lennox. I'm on the Northampton Neighbors Board and I'm a member of the Speaker Series Committee that's bringing you all these ter terrific talks of which this is going to be one. Um, I'm also the moderator for today's talk. And in case you haven't attended one of these talks before, and I know there are some newcomers here, I want to tell you how it's all going to work before we get to our main attraction. But before that, I want to first offer a land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Pocumtuck, Nor Norwatuk, Waronico, Agawam, Nipmuc, and Abenaki peoples who were still living here among us. So what's going to happen today? First, um, we should tell you that we're recording this talk. So you can see it again if you want to, or you can recommend it to your friends. Um, recordings of all the talks are available on Northampton Neighbors YouTube channel, which you can access via the Northampton Neighbors website even if you're not a member. And they're also broadcast on North, uh, Northampton Open Media. So you might also want to check out some of the talks you've missed in the past because all of them have been really, really wonderful. Secondly, we've enabled closed captioning uh, for the talk, which you can access by clicking on live transcript at the bottom of your screen. So if you have hearing problems, as I do, or if you just like to read along while the speaker is speaking, as I also do, um, that will be really helpful for you. It works best if you watch the talk in speak, speaker view, not in gallery view. Um, that means you'll see big pictures of the speakers of the speaker on your screen, rather than seeing a lot of little boxes with all the audience in it. The way you switch to speaker view is go up to the far right hand corner. Uh, you click on view and then you have the option to click on speaker view rather than gallery view. And finally, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat and Martha will answer them in the Q&A. Um, you might want to wait until the end to post your question since Martha may answer it a little later. But if you want to make sure you don't forget, go ahead and post it whenever you want. And you will see already in the chat that Nina Kleinberg, our incredibly able tech uh, guru, has already posted two questions, <laughs> even though she's not supposed to do that till the end. Um, so go ahead and follow Nina's good example. Um, uh, let me tell you too that Martha is going to talk for about 33 minutes as she has carefully timed it and then we'll take your questions. So I know we've got people from all over in our audience, including from Scotland and from Wales and from Texas. So welcome to all of you, wherever you're coming to us from. And because you may be new to our speaker series, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Northampton Neighbors in case you're hearing about us for the first time. We're an all volunteer organization whose motto is a nice pun, engaging in place, which is to say, we're helping our members to age in place, uh, get older in their own homes with dignity and self-determination by engaging in place, engaging in place, creating community, making connections, and remaining active via volunteer opportunities, interest groups, and cultural events like this one. We provide support and a whole range of services for people 55 and over living in Northampton, Florence, and Leeds, though anyone living anywhere of any age can join. Um, we're part of the nationwide village movement, which this year is celebrating its 20th anniversary. And there are 19 villages in Massachusetts alone, though we're the very first one west of Worcester. The way we're different from most villages is that membership is free so that there are not any barriers to anyone becoming part of our community, 
and that's the way we wanted it. Um, maybe in part because we are free, um, as of today, we have 1,093 members, which I think is pretty amazing. And if you aren't a member yet, we'd love it if you become part of us. So please go to our website and sign up. And now to our guests. Martha Hanner has a really illustrious background, kind of amazing background. She's a professor emerita in the astronomy department at UMass. She began her career after completing her PhD at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 1969. For five years, she was a co-investigator of an experiment on Pioneer 10 and 11, the first two spacecrafts to travel beyond Mars for a close flyby of the giant planet Jupiter. She spent the next two years as a visiting scientist at the Max Planck Institute in Germany and I in an earlier life, I had German connections. So I can tell you that is a very distinguished position. Then after her family moved to Pasadena, California, Martha spent 25 years as a senior research scientist at NASA's Caltech Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She worked on a number of space missions, including the Galileo Jupiter Orbiter, the Euro European mission to Comet Halley, the Spitzer Infrared Space Telescope, and Stardust, a spacecraft that returned a sample of particles from a comet. She also conducted a research program on comets using the large telescopes at 14,000 feet on Mauna Kea, Hawaii. She retired from NASA and moved to Amherst in 2003, um, which is, I think, when she became connected to UMass. So, I discovered from her UMass website that the title of her talk today, Exploring Our Solar, solar System, um, is the same title as Astronomy 101, the course she taught at UMass for several years. So I hope we will learn from her as successfully as her students did over those many years. So Martha, take it away. Well, thank you very much for uh, that nice introduction and welcome to all of you. I must say that trying to explore the solar system in half an hour is a little bit of a challenge here. Uh, first, uh, share the screen. Yeah. So within our lifetime, the planets and moons of our solar system have been transformed from distant points of light into unique worlds with a surprising variety of physical properties. I've been privileged to be part of that process. And so today I'd like to take you on a tour of some of the amazing discoveries. Oops, there we go, all right. Uh, our solar system has four small rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and four large gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and little Pluto. The sun and the planets formed about 4.6 billion years ago. So zip up your spacesuits and let's start our journey. So our first stop is the moon. And you probably remember exactly where you were on July 20th of 1969, uh, when the first uh, person from planet Earth stepped out on the moon. I certainly remember that. There were six Apollo missions between 1969 and 1972, and the last three with lunar rovers. Various science instruments were set up, but the main task was gathering rock samples and documenting the location of each one. And so the return lunar rocks were the key to unlocking the history of our solar system. In the laboratory, one can determine the age of a rock from its radioactivity. And so correlating the age of each rock with the location where it was found on the moon, we learned that there was a high rate of impact cratering on the moon that around four to 3.9 billion years ago. And as a result, we can use the cratering rate over time to help date other planetary surfaces where we just have pictures and no rock samples. 
So in parallel with the manned space program, the first spacecraft flybys of the inner planets occurred. So grab your sunscreen and let's head to planet Mercury, which is the closest planet to the sun. Uh, its size is about four tenths of Earth's size. Mercury zips around the sun in just 88 days. Because there's no atmosphere, the surface experiences extreme day-night temperature changes. The temperature at high noon could reach as much as 800 degrees Fahrenheit, and the low temperature at night could go all the way down to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is a 1,000 degree temperature change between day and night. So Mariner can't by in 1974, and then the Messenger spacecraft, shown here, spent four years in orbit. Notice the sun shape, see. And it discovered many things. It has a very large iron core compared to the other terrestrial planets. Uh, it has no atmosphere, but Messenger measured tenuous gases that indicated a surprisingly high abundance of volatiles in the crust, particularly sulfur. But the biggest surprise, because Mercury's pole is oriented exactly perpendicular to its orbit plane, craters at the poles never see sunlight. And the Messenger spacecraft detected that in the side, some of the polar craters was actually frozen water ice. You know, water ice at that distance from the sun, really amazing. And so here's a close up of the surface. If you look at number one, you see various impact craters, and in between, you see smooth areas that represented. Uh, old lava flows and look at the bottom and you'll see the outline of a crater that got filled in with lava. And so by counting the craters on different parts of the surface, uh, we've learned that Mars's, I mean, Mercury's active period when it was you know, pouring out lava uh, ended about three and a half billion years ago. And there was just small volcanic activity since then, as you can see in number two, which uh, shows a picture of a volcano. And so uh, down the lower slides, uh, uh, a big impact basin on Mercury called the Calorus Basin. It's one of the largest impact craters in the solar system. Uh, the, the left, the colored one was color coded to indicate the different kinds of minerals. Uh, the right-hand one is what you'd see if you look down from orbit, uh, but uh, called Calorus because it comes to high noon when Mercury is closest to the sun, so it has the highest temperatures of anywhere on the planet, and um, also indications that there's kind of volcanoes around the edges where you see the little orange and yellow circles on the colored one. Okay, so from Mercury, we move on to... Venus, and uh, Venus uh, is about the same size as Earth and about seven tenths of Earth's distance from the sun. And um, it is just shrouded in clouds. You can't see the surface at all uh, from, from Earth. It has a mass, massive carbon dioxide atmosphere. And consequently, the surface temperature is an amazing 870 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than mercury. It's hot enough to melt lead. Mm -hmm. And the clouds, they're composed of sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. So how do you map the surface of a planet that's just covered with clouds? Well, the answer is radar. And so the Magellan uh, space mission orbited Venus and it used the radar to slowly but surely map the surface strip by strip over, over the course of, of uh, two Venus years. Uh, so the next slide shows uh, one. So here is a reconstructed three-dimensional image, so to speak, of Venus's surface taken with radar. And the mountain in the front is about a mile high and it was a volcano. You can see the, all the lava flows that came out and the 
kind of the caldera in the center. The mountain in the back is about five miles high. Mm -hmm. And so are any volcanoes active today? Well, we haven't caught any in the act. However, measurements of gases in the atmosphere indicate that the amount of sulfur dioxide really varies. And that makes one suspicious that maybe somewhere down there, uh, there's some uh, active volcanoes letting off gases. So we're still looking at that sense. Yeah. So uh, here actually is a picture of the surface. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union sent a dozen missions to Venus in the 1970s and 80s, and four landed successfully on the surface and transmitted images and other data. And so here you see these vast lava plains. There were very few impact craters on Venus. And so that tells us that the whole surface must have been covered by lava flows about 500 to 700 million years ago, which is short on the age of the solar system. But can you imagine standing there on the surface in this intense dry heat and this suffocating atmosphere that has a pressure of being like a uh, half mile deep in the ocean? It <laughs> so Venus, here it is, uh, our twin. Same size as Earth, same composition, same internal heating, so on. And yet it's an environmental disaster. Mm -hmm. And so what we think may have happened is that Venus being a little closer to the sun was just enough warmer so that oceans, if they ever formed, quickly evaporated, uh, could no longer absorb the carbon dioxide. And that led to this really strong greenhouse effect. So watch out. <laughs> okay, well, so now we pass and wave to planet Earth, the beautiful water planet, uh, our only home, the only place we know of that has the conditions that and stability that could lead to advanced life forms. Yeah. And then we go on to Mars. Mars is about one and a half times Earth's distance from the sun. And uh, gets about half as much solar energy as Earth and is about half the size of Earth. And in this picture, which was taken from a Hubble Space Telescope, you can see Mars has polar caps that change with the season and the light and dark areas seem to change with the season. Mars has global dust storms. And so we know it's got wind and weather and so on. Um, and so it's always been an intriguing place. Yeah. So Olympus Mons, the grandest volcano in the solar system, it's 16 miles high and almost 400 miles in diameter. Uh, it would take days just to drive around it in your dune buggy uh, with a cliff that was you know, several miles high around the base. Uh, incredibly impressive, yes. And the last lava flows, we think, were about 100 million years ago again, relatively recent in the age of the solar system. Could it ever be active again? Well, we really don't know. There's little Mars quakes that have been discovered. And does that mean that there's really, uh, you know, lava flowing beneath the surface? We don't know. Uh, so here is a topographic map of Mars that was um, put together by radar altimetry. And so the colors indicate, whoops, sorry. The colors indicate the altitude uh, where White's the highest, uh, Olympus Mons off to the left and three other massive volcanoes there. And then red means high and blue means low. And one of the things you can see is that the two hemispheres are very different in their height. And that is a great puzzle that we don't understand yet. Mm -hmm. But it's the Southern hemisphere that's high and you can see that it's just pockmarked with craters. And that tells us that the Southern hemisphere, that surface has been exposed over most of the age of the solar system. Whereas the Northern hemisphere at some point got covered over. Also, you see then down in the South, there's one very large impact crater called the Hellas Basin that's five miles deep and more than a thousand miles wide. 
So impacts were happening throughout the inner solar system there. Okay. So Mars today is a cold, dry desert. The average temperature is something like minus 55 Celsius. It could get as high as zero at the equator on a nice warm day for a few hours, but that's about it. So, but when we look at the Southern hemisphere, and remember I said that surface is old because of the craters, and look what you see. Uh, you see a drainage pattern. You see that, uh, you know, it flows together like tributaries. It gets wider and deeper as it flows downhill. The, the downhill slope is toward the bottom. And look at the crater at the left, the little smiling face. And you see how there's, uh, it looks like there was a flow either into or out of that crater. Maybe it had a lake at one time in the very distant past. Yes. And then you look down at the lower uh, plot. And that is an image of what we would call a catastrophic outflow. It looked like something caused an underground reservoir of water or liquid anyway to suddenly break loose and flow. And we see something similar in the scab lands of Eastern Washington state where Lake Missoula suddenly emptied back at the end of the last ice age. <laughs> so if there was water, did simple life ever begin? And the more we explore Mars, the more evidence there is that there is still water ice down below the surface. And so that's very intriguing. And that's one of the motivations for the various rovers that we're sending to Mars. So follow uh, the future exploration of Mars. Okay. Uh, and so beyond Mars, we cross the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. And this is a region of space where no single planet ever formed. Uh, there are hundreds, hundreds of millions of rocks, actually, the largest four asteroids are a few hundred miles in size, like this picture of Vesta down here. Uh, but contrary to your science fiction movies, space is so vast that the asteroids are very, very far apart. And there's not much danger of crashing into one. In fact, it takes a lot of work to get close enough to one to get one of these images. So, mm -hmm. and then beyond the asteroid belt, we come to the realm of the gas giants where um, the distances, sizes are all on just a much bigger scale. Yeah. Although we have sent uh, orbiting spacecraft to both Jupiter and Saturn, uh, it was the Voyager spacecraft that gave us our first good views of um, all of the outer planets. And in fact, Voyager is still going and still alive. So, yes. Okay, so Jupiter, the giant then, uh, it's more than five times Earth's distance from the sun. It takes 12 Earth years to go around the Earth once. And it's about 11 times the size of Earth. And its mass is more than all of the rest of the planets put together. It's like the solar system has the sun and one small other object, and then lots of little bits of debris. <laughs> and Jupiter does throw his weight around in the solar system too. And this massive planet rotates in just 10 Earth hours. And you can see all of just the turbulence in the clouds there that's due in part to this rapid rotation. And the different colors mean uh, different trace elements and minerals that are, that are gases in the atmosphere. The white bands are high, cold ammonia crystals in the upper atmosphere. And that black dot is a shadow of one of Jupiter's moons and so on. And there you see Jupiter's giant red spot, which is the size of two Earths. And it's a storm system that has apparently persisted for hundreds of years. It rises up above the level of the other clouds and also uh, extends lower in the atmosphere. So it's a huge energetic system 
and you see all these other white ovals that are also storm systems and you see the turbulent motion in, in videos, you can actually watch it spinning and the clouds go by, you can check it out. But now, uh, there, this is the picture that you need to have for a wall hanging, right? Uh, this is a high resolution image of the red spot taken by the Juno spacecraft, which is currently in orbit around Jupiter. And I really recommend you check out the Juno website to get amazing images of, of all parts of Jupiter's atmosphere here. And you can just see the amazing turbulence and the huge amount of energy uh, that's involved. Yes, okay. So Jupiter has many moons. Uh, it has four large ones. And Callisto here is the outermost of these four large moons. And if you like craters, you would love Callisto because it's saturated with them, more craters than any other object in the solar system. And that tells us that Callisto does not have geologic activity. That's, this surface has been there for four billion years. And you ask, why are the craters white? Well, it's because Callisto's surface is a mix of rock and mainly ice. And so the same thing happens as if you took a block of ice and started smashing it with a hammer. You'd get the shattering and the scatter light make it look bright. Uh, so there's Callisto. And Callisto is about the size of the planet Mercury. Mm -hmm. And moving inward then, uh, the next large moon is Ganymede, and it's larger than Mercury. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. And as you can see, it's got more structure in its surface. And that indicates that indeed, somewhere over the age of the solar system, it has had some volcanic activity. And the dark areas seem to be older. They have more craters. Uh, the lighter areas, uh, you see the insert there shows a high resolution of one of those where it's got some grooved terrain. It looks like there's been some compression and uh, stretching and you know, various volcanic activity uh, in Ganymede at some time over the eons. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Ganymede may have a salty ocean about 100 miles beneath the crust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but if you think Ganymede is big, Look at it compared to Jupiter. See, Ganymede's that little tiny object down at the bottom there that just happened to be captured in an image. And so all size is relative. So that's the size that Mercury would be compared to Jupiter. Yeah. All right. mm -hmm. And then moving inward, another of Jupiter's large moons is Europa. It's about the size of Earth's moon. And as you can see, it has almost no impact craters. Yeah, there's looks like there's one down toward the bottom there. And so that means that mm, there must have been some kind of activity that's covered the surface over really within uh, millions of years. Mm -hmm. And you see all these long cracks that are uh, you know, kind of brownish in color. Uh, the, the bluish tinge is probably not real, it's more white, but that is water ice. It's mainly just ice. Uh, you know, at that distance from the sun, ice is frozen solid. Yes. Uh, so now I am going to show you a really amazing picture that's a high resolution picture that's taken just below the middle of that X that you can see. So there, if you look, there is this fractured surface. Uh, and so just with your eye, just follow some of the individual cracks and the individual mile size blocks. And you can see how they fractured and rotated around. You know, clearly there has just been a lot of motion. Uh, and so that means there must be you know, a layer of liquid or at least slush down below that's moving around and these objects are, are floating in or at one time were and frozen. Again, there's almost no craters. There's two tiny impact craters I can see, but you know, they're awfully small. They're not like the ones that we, I've showed you on other 
other moons, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we think that all this movement is caused by tidal flexure, that is the pull of Jupiter's huge gravity uh, versus the pull of the other big moons and so on uh, can heat the interior. And so Europa may have as much ocean as planet Earth just beneath the surface. And uh, NASA's Europa Clipper mission will launch to Jupiter in a few years to explore this more. But it makes you wonder, you know, uh, at the base of Earth's ocean, uh, there are actually colonies of life, these black smokers. And uh, does Europa have something similar? Yeah. Okay, and finally we come inward to Io, the last of the big moons. It's again about the size of Earth's moon. And when Voyager sent back this picture, he thought, what is going on here? You know, the great big pizza in the sky. <laughs> we didn't know what this was. Uh, and then after the scientists uh, went away for their weekend, whoops, um, and the navigation team came in, they looked at this image you see over to the right. And that's an image of the crescent Io with the sun mostly shining on the other side. And if you look carefully, you see a little fuzzy blob off of the edge of the moon. And then you see this bright blob uh, sticking up in what should have been uh, part of the dark side of the moon. So it must have been something high up in the atmosphere. And that was the discovery that Io has active volcanoes. And so now you say, aha, you look back at the big pizza and everything you see that has a black center surrounded by a yellow circle, that is an active volcano. And all the colors are due to sulfur because it's mainly sulfur volcanoes, although there's some real you know, silicate rock like earth, but, uh, and so sulfur often is yellow. And so, you know, the material comes out and gets deposited in a ring around, uh, makes it yellow. And the various oranges are different colored, colors and some compounds of sulfur. So here we are out in the distant outer solar system on a small moon sized object that's full of active volcanoes. And again, this is due to the extreme um, pull of Jupiter's gravity and the flexures from the other uh, big moons too. Poor Io just can't get into equilibrium. It's always being tugged uh, and that stresses the rocks inside and just really heats things. So big surprise. Now we move on to Saturn. Uh, nine and a half times Earth's distance from the sun, uh, nine and a half times Earth in size. And Saturn takes about 29 years to orbit the sun once. And like Jupiter, uh, its interior is mainly hydrogen and helium with a rocky core. And the haze you see is uh, ammonia ice uh, clouds at high altitude, you know, hiding uh, the cloud decks below. Mm -hmm. And so the Cassini spacecraft spent more than 13 years in orbit around Saturn, studying Saturn and its beautiful rings, and um, also then some of Saturn's interesting moons. Mm -hmm. So the most interesting moon is Titan. Titan, again, is the size of Mercury. It's just slightly smaller than Ganymede. And uh, Titan has a massive atmosphere. It has more atmosphere than planet Earth. And here it is, just a moon of Saturn. Uh, and um, so it's got a surface temperature of around 94 Kelvin. And so, because the Cassini spacecraft dropped off a probe to go down through the atmosphere to learn a little more about Titan. And there we go. Okay. So uh, as the probe descended through the atmosphere with its cameras on and pointed down, and once it got below the clouds, look what it saw. It saw 
drainage pattern. You know, we've seen that before, right? And again, you know, you see the little tributaries kind of joining together and uh, wider and deeper as it flowed downhill, obviously that was uh, some liquid drainage. But at 94 Kelvin, water ice is hard as rock, okay? And then the view from the surface was these rounded pebbles that would indicate you know, tumbling in a liquid flow. So is, did the Huygens probe land in the stream bed? You know, what's going on here? Well, at 94 Kelvin, as I said, water ice is hard as rock, but methane is a liquid, ethane is a liquid. And from studying both the images and the composition of the atmosphere, both uh, remotely and as the probe went down through it, uh, and uh, the radar from the surface that I'll show you in a minute, we think that Titan really has active weather, kind of like Earth, except that it's not water rain, it's methane rain. And, uh, the Cassini also did a radar map of the surface and in the north polar regions, this is what it saw. It saw obviously a liquid, which meant there was almost no radar reflection and it was dark. And so here you have two lakes, each one 10 to 15 miles in size and they must be lakes of ethane. Okay. So uh, there is going to be a wonderful mission to Titan called the Dragonfly that should arrive in 2034, land on the surface. And if successful, then it's going to have a little helicopter or kind of a drone that can fly around in the atmosphere and really study the surface close up. So stay tuned for 2034. <laughs> All right, then there's another uh, interesting moon of Saturn called Enceladus. It's a bright white ball. It's got a, just a very icy, frosty surface with lots of cracks on it. And it has venting gases, as you can see in that right-hand picture. And so Cassini was targeted to fly right through that plume. And uh, it measured the composition of various kinds of you know, hydrocarbon chemicals and tiny solid grains and so on. So something is venting from some of these cracks down near the South Pole. And so we think Enceladus may have um, pools of liquid water down underneath and another uh, interesting target to explore with a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, quickly moving on then in our journey, uh, Voyager 2 went by Uranus in 1986. Uh, Uranus looks blue. That's because it's got an atmosphere with methane gas and methane absorbs red light and scatters blue light. Yes. And both Uranus and Neptune are similar in size with diameter about four times that of Earth. And Uranus is interesting because its spin axis is tipped all the way over 90 degrees, so sort of into the orbit plane. And so it means that Mercury barrels around the sun, it rolls around on its side, and the North Pole points toward the sun for one good part of the year, and then the South Pole for the other part of the year. So uh, very, very different kind of uh, heating patterns and so on and, uh, than we're used to. So beyond Uranus, we get to Neptune, also looking very blue because of methane in its atmosphere. And it's only been visited by Voyager. When Voyager went by, there was a large storm system. You can see that dark blue oval and the, the white clouds looking like somewhat like Jupiter's red spot. But since 1989, that storm has disappeared. So we really uh, don't know too much about it. And some future time, we hope there will be uh, an orbiting spacecraft way out there. Mm -hmm. And finally, then we reach little Pluto. Pluto has indeed been visited by the New Horizons spacecraft in 2015. It just was a flyby. And so here it is. It's 
ranges from about 30 to 50 times Earth's distance from the sun because it's got a very elliptical orbit, but very far away. So the sun is like, just looking like a bright star in the distance. And you see that great big heart on its surface. Well, that is nitrogen ice about two and a half miles deep, a whole sheet of nitrogen ice there. Uh, and let's see, so I'm going to show you one last slide of the surface of Pluto here. And so look at that, it's a real world right way out there. Uh, it's got in sheets of ice that are mainly nitrogen and some carbon monoxide, and then mountains of water ice sticking up. And so the New Horizons flyby and all the images and measurements uh, discover that Pluto, you know, has a little bit of geologic activity, if you can call it that. It seems as if it has something that we call cryovolcanism, i.e. sort of uh, liquid water below the surface that then can spout out uh, like a volcano. Uh, so not a totally dead world, but um, all we have is this brief flyby so far. So this is your, your picture of little Pluto out there. Mm -hmm. And so we've come to the end of our journey. However, there are five spacecraft from planet Earth that are journeying out into the stars. The two pioneer spacecraft and two Voyagers and now New Horizons. And the last week's signal from the Pioneer 10 was detected, oh, way back 19 years ago now. That was the first spacecraft that I worked on. So it was tough to say goodbye. But then the Voyager spacecraft were launched in 1977. This is 2022 and we are still hearing from them. The Voyager spacecraft are now, let's see, I have it down somewhere here. Um, Voyager 1 is now about 156 times Earth's distance from the sun. And the radio signal from Voyager, the very tiny weak signal, traveling at the speed of light takes 21 and a half hours to reach Earth traveling at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's really exciting to me is that the Voyager spacecraft have now crossed the boundary into interstellar space. Mm -hmm. The sun always is putting out just a stream of atomic particles and an associated magnetic field. We call it the solar wind. And that just streams out and any spacecraft in interplanetary space can detect it and so on. Uh, well, the Voyager spacecraft, it's, it's instruments that could detect, you know, fast moving atomic particles and magnetic fields were still working. And in the summer of 1912, suddenly things changed. The direction of the particles changed, the magnetic field changed and Voyager had actually passed this boundary that's shown in this sort of old uh, picture of what we call the termination or the heliopause and so on. And it was now sensing the charged atomic particles that are out in interstellar space, what we would call galactic cosmic rays. And so though it's still uh, somewhat feeling uh, the sun's gravitational pull, and there's still lots of little icy comets that orbiting the sun out beyond Voyager. It's really in interstellar space, wandering among the stars. Mm -hmm. And so the past 50 years have brought a new understanding of our solar system. Now with the launch of the James Webb telescope in particular, a new era begins. And among other goals, the James Webb telescope will seek to characterize planets around other stars. Uh, we know now that many, if not most stars have planets. You know, are there other Earths? What are they like way out there in the distant part of our galaxy? And so in the lifetime of my two young friends, 
who are watching today, what will we learn? And so with that, I'll say thank you and hope you've enjoyed the tour. Sarah, you are muted. Um, thank you so much, Martha, for this totally interesting talk with these <laughs> totally amazing slides. Um, and there are also totally amazing questions in the chat. Um, and I'm going to ask Martha, would it be okay if we stayed a little past four o'clock? Do you have sure. the time to do that? Okay with me. Great. So of course, yeah, if you have to leave, yeah. just go ahead and leave, no problem. Um, but I'd, I'd love to have some of these great questions get answered. But before we get to the q and A, I I have a word from our sponsor. So <laughs> the first word from our sponsor is um, what the next talk is going to be. Um, on March 4th, Ira Helfand and Henry Rosenberg from Physicians for Social Responsibility are going to be talking about the growing danger of nuclear war, the history of resistance and what we can do. So I'm sure you absolutely won't wanna miss that. And let me say really as a word from our sponsor, um, as I said before, Northampton Neighbors is free, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have expenses. So if you'd enjoyed this terrific talk, please consider donating to Northampton Neighbors, which you can do by clicking on the donate button on our website, northamptonneighbors.org, and paying by credit card or PayPal. And I'm right now I am going to put our PayPal link in the chat as well. Um, or you could just um, mail us a good old fashioned check and the address is on our website as well. Okay, so now to our these great questions. Okay, the first one is uh, from Nina Kleinberg. What are your thoughts about intelligent life in the universe? Okay, yes, let's see. Well, uh, what we know about our solar system is that, um, we don't have any other intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Uh, there may be other life, but it would be, you know, uh, tiny and primitive. But now we have discovered so far that there are, you know, we've discovered thousands of planets around other stars. And we've discovered enough that the statistics are clear uh, that there must be millions of planets out there. And so far from the ones we've discovered, uh, we don't find any other planet that's kind of similar to Earth in, in, in size and at about the right distance. But, you know, we've only looked at, at very, very, very few of them. So the question is, even if we find a planet that is sort of like Earth in the sense of having a solid surface and water on its surface and the right kind of temperatures. Um, what kind of star did it have? Did it really have a star that's been stable over billions of years that have allowed life to evolve uh, from the very simple one-celled bacteria into you know, complex uh, thinking uh, life like ours? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's rather rare in that sense, but if you have millions and millions of, of planets out there, then surely the statistics are that somewhere out there, uh, there's, there's a life that has uh, evolved and advanced. Uh, so whether it's anything reachable, uh, we don't know. I mean, just recently, uh, Planets have been discovered around one of the uh, nearby stars that's kind of like our sun, uh, Alpha Centauri, which is a bright star visible in the southern hemisphere. Uh, you know, what are they like? <laughs> Great. 
<laughs> so here's a question that I bet a lot of people had who went to school a while ago. Um, why did Pluto get demoted as a planet? <laughs> yes, poor Pluto. Well, it was discovered in 1930 and uh, it was exciting, ah, you know, the ninth planet and so on. And at the time we didn't really know how big it was. Because even if you know how far away an object is and how you measure its brightness, uh, the brightness depends on both the size of the object and its reflectivity. And it turns out Pluto is brighter, has a higher reflectivity than we thought originally. And so it turned out to be a little smaller than we thought. And actually there are seven moons in our solar system that are larger than Pluto. So, uh, size alone really wouldn't do it. But then what happened was that starting in the 1990s really and continuing with, with large telescopes that were sort of scanning the sky, we started discovering other objects out beyond Pluto that are about the size of Pluto. And so then we started to say, well, now, every time you discover an object that's kind of the size of Pluto right out there, do you then call it a planet too? Uh, do we have just you know a, a sort of steadily increasing number of planets? So that was kind of a question. And then uh, a group in the International Astronomical Union uh, decided, uh, well, you know, how do you define a planet? Well, it has to orbit the sun, uh, but then, uh, Pluto's orbit is very tilted compared to the orbits of the other planets, which are all in about the same plane to within a degree or two. Pluto's orbit is tilted by well, 17 degrees or more. And it seems like it you know, had kind of a different origin. Maybe it came from farther out. Uh, so it really seemed different. So um, this body in the International Astronomical Union decided that they would call Pluto and these other objects that were being discovered dwarf planets. That means they were still kind of planets, but we were going to make a separate category uh, because they were all smaller and they all had these similar properties and were out, out there. So I don't know, I don't feel strongly one way or another. I think if it had been my choice, I would have left Pluto as being a planet just for <laughs> reasons. Well, we all learned about it that way. And so, uh, but, but those were the basic reasons. So I'm glad that uh, this group decided to send a spacecraft there because at least now we've seen it. Uh, we've, we, you can see from that lovely picture that it's a real place with, with you know, re a real scenery and, uh, you know, mountains and uh, plains and everything, even if they are made of exotic ices. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a really different question. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, but the, no, it's oh, okay. just a minute. I'm, I'm seeing something in the, in, the, in the chat that was a good re, re reminder here that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has written a whole book uh, about uh, Pluto and, you know, should it be a planet or why isn't it and so on. And it makes, I haven't myself read it, but uh, quite a few of my friends have. And so I, I would recommend that as, as, as something you might want to read. So thanks to whoever flashed that up. Okay, really different question uh, from Fran Deutsch. Um, how much cooperation is there between Russia and the U.S. on space exploration? And we might also ask about China. Yes, well, I, I know more about the history of Russia because that goes, you know, all the way back, really, uh, to the 60s, 70s. At first, in, in the 70s, say, when they were having their missions to Venus and so on, they really didn't talk much about a mission until afterwards, you know, they didn't want, because, you know, back back then, both the US and the Soviet Union were, were having a fair number of failures too, you know, but the Venera uh, uh, data from Venus were shared with a, with a group of scientists at Brown University, for instance, uh, that were working on, on Venus and the surface of Venus. And then in the, in the 1980s, uh, several nations sent probes to Comet Halley uh, at the time that the decisions had to be made around 1980. You know, the US was just having a 
a change of government and, uh, you know, uh, conservatives and slashing taxes and, you know, sending a big mission to a comet didn't quite fit in the, with the picture. Uh, but the European uh, Union together sent a mission and the Soviet Union sent two. And a colleague of mine at JPL was responsible for targeting all the world's spacecraft to Comet Halley, including the Soviet ones. Uh, I guess it would have been an international incident if he'd missed or something. But I was at the European mission and, uh, and the, the Soviet scientists came there they had just had their spacecraft go past the comet and had been very successful. Uh, and so they came to Germany for the European mission, which was going to go extremely close, closer than any of the others. Uh, and it was extremely exciting. And the Soviet scientists were so excited. I mean, I heard the, the, the man who was the head of the, of the space agency there uh, from, the, from Moscow, saying that the night that the European mission went by, oh, this is the most exciting night of my life. You know? <laughs> they, were, they were so thrilled. And, and, and there had been just a lot of cooperation there. So in the 1980s, there was more cooperation. And I actually, if you don't mind my going on a little bit, have, have my own particular view. You know, Common Halley comes around once a human lifetime. And in the old centuries, it was thought that comets really influenced human life. Well, I like to think that Comet Halley in 1986 really contributed to glasnost in the, in, uh. in, this, in the Soviet Union, because that was the first big missions that they were really open about. They invited American and European scientists to contribute instruments to their missions and so on. It was very open and free. And the the man who was the head of the of the space agency, who I heard you know speak, was also a friend of Gorbachev, and somehow you know openness uh, in the in the space program had been very successful. It led to this extremely successful mission, and so I like to think that that helped bring about a lot of <laughs> in the Soviet Union. Thanks. For <laughs> there, that that's really great. That's really great. Okay, here is a question from. Um, our, one of our speakers on March 4th, Henry Rosenberg, ah. how, how worried should we be that the future of Earth is, well, Venus? Yes, uh, I would say no. I mean, yes, of course, we're worried about climate change, but the comparison is we're talking about, you know, uh, the atmosphere of Earth, if I'm not mistaken, used to have about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And now we've gone up climbing each year and we're above 400 parts per million. But I'm saying parts per million, you know? That's a very small amount of carbon dioxide relative to our whole atmosphere, whereas Venus, it's 96% carbon dioxide and the mass of the atmosphere is almost 100 times Earth's atmosphere. So what's interesting is a little bit of carbon, of carbon dioxide can really impact our climate. But what's also interesting is it only takes a few degrees of global temperature change to really change the weather patterns uh, and, and the climate here on planet Earth. It tells you how sensitive things are, but I really don't think that we have much chance of becoming like Venus until 5 billion years from now when, <laughs> when the sun uh, you know, evolves and you know, really heats things. <laughs> Well, that is. So good. I don't know that if, that's an, if that's the kind of answer you were. You were for, <laughs> well, uh, not exactly in our lifetime. That is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Nina has another question. Uh, um, what are Saturn's rings made of? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, <laughs> I remember at JPL, one, above one of the Xerox machines, there was a, a little cartoon that says the rings of Saturn are probably composed entirely of lost luggage. But <laughs> actually, actually, that size is not too bad an analogy because the, the rings are composed of rocks and ice. 
uh, ranging in size from very fine, uh, you know, grains of sand, but mostly sort of boulders and pieces. And what's interesting is that the, the ring plane is very thin with the, the Cassini mission at Saturn, you know, would pass down perpendicular to the rings and, and take a photograph. And it's this very thin layer that's literally only meters thick. And we, we think that rings like the other giant planets do have very, very tenuous rings also. And we think what happens is if a satellite moves in too close to the planet, the differential tug of gravity of the, of the giant planet between the front of the satellite and the back of the satellite uh, is enough to pull the satellite apart, the moon apart. And, and we think that's, that's what happened. You know, we saw from Io just that the differential force of gravity between the front and back of Io causes these big stresses that have really heated the planet. But Io is safely outside that limit where it would be pulled apart. But, so suitcases or boulders. Right, or suitcases, right. <laughs> I wondered where my suitcase was. Yes. Um, okay, here's, uh, here's a question from somebody who knows a lot, Dorothy Barr. And I don't know how to pronounce this word. Enceladus, yeah. Enceladus, Enceladus has been in the news because of slush, slushy stuff from the surface, but it also has an underground ocean. Can you tell us more and tell us even what Enceladus is? Yeah, well, Enceladus is is a, is a moon of Saturn and a uh, few hundred miles in size. I don't remember right offhand uh, how big. Uh, and so it'll be made of a mix of rocks and ices. And that picture I showed of the bright, bright surface means that it was a frost layer. So water ice had, had spewed out of those vents and then recondensed on the surface to make that really bright surface. And so, yes, in order to have those vents and so on, we really think that there are, you know, either pockets or an ocean or something, a depth of water ice, but it's still a puzzle as to why the, the subsurface got heated. I mean, did Enceladus have a different history? Was it closer to Saturn at one time and feeling this gravitational pull? You know, what was the reason really that its interior got heated? Uh, but definitely there's talk of, of planning a mission that would really focus on uh, and Enceladus, uh, you can use you know, a really close in orbit and gravity sometimes to be able to tell something about the, the density structure within an object uh, and so on. And, and clearly, you know, there's enough venting that there has to be a liquid reservoir in there. Um, that's Great. as much as I know. <laughs> Okay, Rachel and David have a, have a worried question. Um, um, they say they've heard that a rocket or satellite is going to collide with the moon. Should we worry about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the details. I've read sometime in the past that uh, maybe one of the, of the rockets that launched some kind of a satellite or something uh, you know, that was still kind of orbiting might crash into the moon. The other thing that we do get more concerned about is uh, errant asteroids. Now, most of the all the asteroids are safely out in the belt between Mars and Jupiter and have orbits that are sort of close to circular. But every so often, either the result of a collision or result more also of a resonance with Jupiter, you know, that's that big guy with strong gravity that, you know, impacts a lot of things and, you know, slow tugs uh, by Jupiter's gravity can change the orbit of an object and um, can then bring a very small fraction of these asteroids into orbits that come closer than Mars, that could come to Earth. But it's a slow process. And so what planetary scientists uh, started doing in the, in the 1990s was convincing um, NASA and Congress to provide the money to have uh, initiate some studies, the telescopes that would just scan the sky and try to find all of the large objects that had orbits that brought them in and could cross Earth's orbit. And so that uh, 
that project really was successful. It took only a few telescopes and not a huge amount of money by you know, NASA standards to just totally scan the sky every clear night for some years. And we think we, that, that almost all of the objects uh, closer than Mars that have a size, a diameter larger than a kilometer uh, have now been detected. And the idea is to detect them you track them and you get their orbit, you calculate the orbit very accurately, then you continue to follow them. And there's a whole amateur astronomy uh, a group that just kind of then tracks known asteroids and you know keeps tabs on them. And there's a whole uh, space at, at, at JPL, they call Near Earth Objects, N-E-O. And you, know, you can go to this website at JPL and it you know, has lists of them all. So now there's telescopes, one big one on um, uh, on Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii, that's really trying to look for the smaller objects, ones that are few, hundreds of meters in size. They'll be fainter and there's lots more of them instead of having, you know, uh, 900 to 1,000, there's probably tens of thousands, but we're now trying to track those too. So then you would know if any object uh, was predicted to come threateningly close to the Earth decades from now, and that would give time to characterize the object and decide what one could do to deflect it. Because you want to deflect it in a way that for sure moves it away from Earth, right? <laughs> you know, not, not the wrong way. So you have to know its size, its density, its rotation speed, and all. So that's. So I'm not worried about the rocket. I'm I'm worried about the asteroids. But okay. right. So here's another question from Rachel and David about really far away. It seems like the James Webb probe has gone flawlessly. What could possibly go wrong going forward? What oh. can we learn about the origin of the universe? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, for astronomers, we, it's, we have this feeling that all our eggs are in one basket, you know, this incredibly complex, sophisticated mission. So, you know, it's been, just been holding our breath ever since Christmas Day. I mean, it was so exciting to have it successfully launched, but you have this complex uh, mirror that's 18 hexagonal mirrors that had to be all carefully unfolded and then aligned. So they are now doing the final alignment, I mean, to tiny fractions of a millimeter, you know, they're talking alignment to microns or tens of microns to get a perfect parabolic surface. Uh, and then the instruments are now slowly each one being turned on. So it's a few months. Uh, and then when we get the first images, uh, that will be the, the, I think the true ex excitement there. Uh, I mean, we've had gained experience uh, over the decades and a lot of things we do better now, but there's you know, always a chance of something going wrong. But yes, I mean, because then it's so much larger mirror, you know, the larger the mirror, uh, the more light it can gather and therefore the fainter the objects that it can clearly see and also the resolution, you know, what, what's the fine separation will be improved. And that's why it can look way back in time to the time after this quote, big bang, when uh, the first galaxies were forming uh, and, and see that very faintest structure. And that's just going to be fascinating, but then I'm fascinated by what it's going to be able to do uh, to detect atmospheres uh, around uh, these uh, planets orbiting other stars. Again, you have that you take spectra, uh, you know, to see the different spectral lines of different elements and, and molecules. And again, very, very sensitive and very, very fine spatial resolution. So that's two of the exciting things, but you've got to hold your breath for a few more months. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Okay, we have one final question that I think um, Martha isn't going to be able to answer, but uh -huh. maybe she would be uh, generous enough to um, respond in writing, and I am happy to post it on the 
Northampton Neighbors listserv. And here's the question. Speaking of books, can you perhaps recommend some books covering the topics you've dealt with, planetary discoveries, planetary histories, exploratory missions, or perhaps there is a good bibliography for lay people? So I don't think you can you can answer this in the next two minutes, but- um, Yeah, if, well, you if, know, part of the problem is that by the time a book is published, it's out of date. Right. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that one by Neil deGrasse Tyson about Pluto is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I like was uh, written, you know, some years ago now uh, by the principal scientist from Cornell who uh, on about the Mars rovers, the spirit and opportunity. It's called Roving Mars by Steve Squires. Uh, and it tells what's the trials and tribulations of trying to get a mission uh, proposed, funded, built, uh, you know, successfully launched, successfully landed and follow the mission. Uh, so I found that an interesting one. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether I, I know of any other uh, specific, specific ones. I'll think about it, but I, I'm not, you know, coming up with any uh, good ideas for one. Really, the website uh, are, the, are the best source of information. Yes. I mean, I belong to the learning and retirement program. Some of you who are listening probably are members too. And so we've uh, done a couple uh, uh, seminars then on the solar system and recommended to people that they use uh, the internet, uh, you know, type in either the planet or the names of some of the missions and so on. And there's a lot uh, out there uh, that, that, that tends to be up to date. Yeah. So thank you so much. There are just what, rave reviews in the chat and I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get to all the questions, but that, I think we're going to have to wrap it up right now. Yes. So we found that um, that having people um, unmuting and having people clap doesn't work very well. So let's, <laughs> let's clap this no. way for Martha and yeah, that well, was... thank you all for, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope maybe that piques your curiosity to then go on the internet and, and find some of these amazing images and uh, learn more. And um, well, yeah. thank you so much. And it's been really wonderful. So bye bye, everybody, and okay. come back on yeah. March 4th for another really interesting talk. So okay. bye bye. Appreciate you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.